connected factor is really a means to an end. And today, I want to walk you through the decision process for how you achieve certain ends. We've all heard about Industry 4.0, IoT, IIoT. What, what, what does it, what does it all mean? Why, why the catchphrases? It's been very aspirational. It's, it's been about transformation. And, and I've certainly, over the past five years, have participated in and felt excited about that story. It has other names like digital transformation. But really, what do we want to do in manufacturing? So it's, it's about the fundamentals of this journey of getting to outcomes in business. In manufacturing how are my how am I lowering my variable cost can I have an impact on my fixed cost how is my scrap rework and quality those are the outcomes you want to achieve honestly who cares about connected factory if it isn't directly impacting things that are measurable in your business so I want to bring us back down to the ground out of the clouds Talking about IoT and 4.0, there's certainly an enormous amount of marketing hype around it. And let's get back to basics and fundamentals. So that's the journey I want to take you on today. But I'd like to use Cisco as my opening story. And normally, I don't really open with a story about Cisco because I'm from Cisco. You know, it sounds a little self-serving. But there is something interesting about our history and DNA that tells us something about the journey forward in manufacturing and really begins with this idea of open standards. I'm going to begin this presentation by describing three fundamental things that need to happen in manufacturing for you to achieve the outcomes in quality, in availability, in utilization, in efficiency and OE that you want to get to. There are three fundamental things that you could go to. And the first one is you need to embrace open standards. And I'm going to use Cisco as an example to describe the power of openness when connecting things. So the time period here is from 1990 to 2011. And in that time period, Cisco went from a small startup of about 100 people to the most valued company in the world worth about 580 billion was the price at that time, and we've fallen from those story heights a long time ago, as everyone's probably well aware. But in that journey, we did a lot of giving away. In that journey, over those years, Cisco, what this chart represents is all the technology that we developed, the innovation that we developed, and we gave it away. That's interesting. So how do you go from being a startup to being the most valued company in the world, and we're a manufacturer, right? Just different type of product than you might be doing. We do use, we do use machining, and we do use Mazak machining, actually, it's interesting. But that timeline is interesting. Look at the blue on the top is the innovation, the technology we develop. The green is our giveaway to the market in the form of a standard. Open standards in connectivity in manufacturing is essential to the innovation and to how you're going to achieve growth and profitability and reach for the future of manufacturing. It has to be about open standards. And the story that I want to paint, the picture that I want to paint, is that there is, it is good business, it is good business to operate on the principle of interconnectivity and openness. And it's one of the reasons I'm here is because when I first met Mazak, what was startling to me is Mazak was one of the founders of the MT Connect standard and invested in it at a very, very early stage. And that was very different from the traditional manufacturing OEM strategy. It was more about we develop our special technology and we differentiate, but what Mazak did was quite different. Mazak and Dan was there at the beginning, along with Brian Taffy and the whole team and Tom Yamazaki. Mazak invested in an open standard that enabled them to talk to their customers about interconnectivity and openness. So 
there's two stories here, and I didn't realize it at the time how related Cisco and Mazak were in terms of this journey and this vision for openness. So I begin with this idea that openness is essential and that it should inform you in your strategy when you're thinking about digital transformation to get to the quality, the yield, the OEE metrics you want to achieve. When you make an investment, is the investment based on open standards and interconnectivity? And that's the first question. That's the first fundamental question you have to ask yourself. The next <coughs> principle is connectivity. It kind of seems self-evident, but it's not at the same time. To this day, when I participate in projects where new factories, when concrete foundations are being laid for a factory, I can tell you that the engineering firms and the companies that are building these factories are doing a couple of things. They're laying down some type of industrial process map to the footprint of that factory. They're thinking about their workflows for material in the factory. They're off, almost always thinking about the utilities that they have to implement in that factory. Some of the utilities are power, can't, can't manufacture anything without power, compressed air, automation. I could go on and on about the utilities, but you know what never occurs? I have not seen a factory built from scratch where they consider communications, fundamental open communications, a utility. And I would argue that to be successful in manufacturing now, if you're not thinking of communications, open standards-based communications as a utility, you probably will not be successful because the innovation that's going to occur now and companies like Mazak are leading the way is based on that connectivity. And if you don't believe me, just think about the World Bank. I want to throw out two statistics here. The ultimate example of connectivity is the global internet, right? It's what we are all used to, this incredible level of connectivity where I have this little glass device that I can peer into and look at all the information humanity has ever, ever produced through that one little glass device, right? That's incredible, right? That happened because of open standards, right? But let's just talk about how connectivity impacts global GDP. So the World Bank did a study and found that if you just reduce connect connectivity speed by 50%, you can measure the drop in GDP for a population of 10, 10 million people. It's just north of 0.1%. Connectivity has a direct impact on economic value, a direct impact. And yet, in manufacturing, we're not thinking of it as utility. We're not thinking of it as part of the design for our process, for our material flow, right? So, so if you just look at the world around you, you can find the markers that drive value, and fundamental connectivity is it. And, and if we walk through a factory, right, I, the model on the left is, is the model for manufacturing connectivity, and I don't know if you can see my pointer here, but um, in a lot of manufacturing around the world, it's still a collection of single assets. Certainly if I take you to an auto production line, right, discrete manufacturing, there's an, a, an extraordinary degree of connectivity there and integration and execution, but the vast majority of manufacturers is not connected to the degree, the degree that you would think it would be. And this story of a single asset to a connected production line to a fully integrated factory is still emerging. It is still emerging. And there's certainly enormous proof points, right? If we, if we look at the growth of manufacturing in China, the idea that equipment manufacturers can impact their inventory through connectivity and digital connection, right, may not be obvious, but it's a business differentiator. So that's the second foundation, right? We talk about open standards, we talk about connectivity. Now let's talk more along the lines of what you might be familiar with, which is workflow. So if if you believe in openness, you have machines and sensors and things that are talking a common language in a way that it's easy to communicate with them, it's easy to get data off them, right? We have 
the physical infrastructure, whether it's wireless or wired or 5G or whatever it may be, and we have this idea of connectivity that's pervasive throughout my factory, well, where do I go next? What's the next point that I want to explore in terms of fundamentals that link my activity to some business outcome that drives profit, higher margin, higher quality, higher yield, lower scrap, all the, all the metrics that really matter in our business, well, that's workflow, right? And this is, this is a, a very high level view of workflow in aerospace, right? And there's lots of pieces that I'm leaving out here, but in terms of a connected factory, it is these workflows that drive my business, right? This is where my marginal cost is. This is where my revenue is driven. You follow the path of how something comes together. It's fabricated. There's sub-assembly. There's final assembly, right? Aerospace is an extreme example. But yet, but yet, in many of these facilities, if I want to do a daily roll-up on production, it's a paper roll-up. There's a morning meeting, an operations meeting at 8 a.m., and we're reviewing paper, we're reviewing on a board. It's all real information. A lot of people work hard at getting a picture of what operations look like the day before so that we can make adjustments in schedule. If I took you to some of the biggest aerospace factories in North America, a large percentage of them would still be doing scheduling on a spreadsheet. The dirty little secret in manufacturing is the best IoT software in the world is Microsoft Excel. It's interesting, right? Old, old ways die hard, and you can't blame people, right? I have a capital investment. I am measured on my daily output productivity. If you get in front of a general manager of a plant, you have about 15 minutes to make a case on something transformational. If you're not aligned to their output, their outcomes, Right? You're not making the case. So that's how lean things are run. So it's not a knock on manufacturing, but yet we still have to make the leap and we still have to think in terms of our decision making process. So that's what today's about. Right? How do we make the right decisions to move forward stepwise? And we don't have to reach for the moon to make a difference. Right? A lot of the IoT messaging, Industry 4.0, is lofty. It's, it's about predicting the future. right? It's about predicting the future. It's about AI. It's about machine learning. Well, I'm going to tell you another little dirty secret. Is that the tools, the digital tools to improve your operations are fairly simple. Yeah, you need connectivity. Open standards are essential. But I want to talk to you a little bit about how IoT software integrated to your existing process can be transformational for you. So that's the next step in the journey. But before we get there, I have to talk about some of the challenges and problems that we have to overcome. Right? To get to that place where I'm having a direct impact on business, I have to understand my challenges first. I have to know what I have to overcome. And some of this will be obvious to you, some of it may not be. So let's go back to 101. What is, what is IoT? Right? So manufacturing for the past 100 years has been dominated by automation, whether it's in the form of robotics, whether it's in the form of programmable logic controllers, right? What we would call execution. Planned execution. I mean, if you take an NC program and load it into a CNC, it's planned execution. It's just in a machine, right? G-code in a machine is planned execution. We know the steps we're going to go through. We do it. We do it very efficiently. That's been evolving for 100 years, and it still continues to evolve, and there's still enormous gains to be had with automation and advanced execution, right? At a factory level, at a process level, at a line level, at a machine level. But what of IoT and the process? What are we reaching for? What are we trying to get? Well, I just want to give you a simple definition here to ground us in what we mean when we say Industry 4.0 and IoT. And I, I use it here for simplicity, right? Execution is really a set of instructions that says, rotate this gear so many degrees at this speed with this torque and this axial force. That's execution, very simple, right? You know it 
and it happens a billion times a day. And in fact, manufacturing is really, really good at this stuff. So I don't want to focus on that. People have been doing that for a long time. They know how to do it really well. But what's really interesting is that's planned. The right-hand side here is planned. What was my actual? IoT is fundamentally about understanding what the actual was. That's a different story, right? So what was my torque? What was my vibration on that rotation? And that really matters because, as it turns out, if you're General Motors and you have 100,000 robots, and this is public, by the way, and you have 100,000 robots and you have a certain failure rate on those robots because a gearbox or a reducer fails in those robots on your assembly line, you know what the cost per minute is? About $20,000 per minute. So an unplanned outage on a, on a gearbox failure is really painful. In fact, it shuts down most of the plant. So if you can get the actual data all of these gearboxes, and I'm just using this reference here because there's a, a million of these use cases, you can actually plan for that failure. And even if you don't have advanced algorithms that tell you exactly when it's going to fail, you can still trend towards it. And, and the trending in the vibration, the trending in the torque, the trending in the axial force speaks volumes about the nature of that process. And that's what IoT is about. Just to demystify it. It's not execution. Yes, it, it, we need to know execution. We need to relate execution to that process data. So, so that's what IoT is really all about, is getting to data that we've never gotten to before. Does that make sense? Is that, am I speaking crazy? Pretty straightforward, right? So let's talk about, kind of in a nutshell, what are the problems we have to solve? With IoT, with Industry Port Auto, these marketing terms, let's, let's boil it down to the four things we need to do to make this viable, to make this business investment into something valuable. And I'll tell you another little fact. About 75 to 80% of IoT projects worldwide fail. They fail. And it gets a little bit of a bad name because I think it's about fundamental strategy, how you step into this process, because no one will disagree that getting torque and force values off of gearboxes that are running my operation and being able to predict when a failure is gonna occur isn't valuable, right? We all agree that that's really valuable, right? But if I go in and that's not my target, and my target is to connect up a bunch of devices to have a connected factory, but I have no business outcome, I'm kind of missing the boat, right? And, and for that reason, the first thing that you, an IoT platform should be doing, it should be aligned to outcomes. It should be aligned to addressing a real business need, a real manufacturing need, a real engineering need in that plant. And if it's not tightly coupled to that, if you don't begin the journey with a business outcome in mind, forget about the technology. There's, in my presentation today, I'm not gonna talk about a single cool technology really because it's not a technology problem. It's an alignment issue. It's business value, right? That's where we've got to focus. It's really simple. Working for Cisco all these years, I want to sell technologies, no question about it. But if I walk into a customer and we begin our discussion about technology and we never get to the discussion about how it changes their business, what's the point? Even if the customer spends a million dollars on Cisco gear, walks away and then comes back to us six months later and said, I don't know why I made that investment, that's not a good outcome, right? So we begin with an outcome that matters to the business and if the general manager, if the head of engineering can't see that very clearly, then the project's not worth it, right? So first important decision point in your journey towards connecting up a factory. The next thing is language. I have a slide in a minute where I'm just going to show you the crazy amount of languages and protocols, and it's just a small sampling of what we see in manufacturing worldwide. Everything talks its own language. It has its own protocol. It has its own data model, right? So language matters. So that IoT platform had better solve the language problem for all the capital that you have that is talking different. If you're lucky enough to have Mazak, you can get your data in the form of MT Connect. 
because Mazak made a decision well over a decade. Is it more than a decade ago, Dan? It's over a decade. Right, Brian? Hi, Brian. Right. So, so Mazak understood the value of that data early on. Right. So they, they began to address the language problem a long time ago, which was, again, probably why I'm here. Right? Um, security. It goes without saying that these machines, this automation, these sensors, when they were originally designed, were not designed with the internet in mind. They were not designed with the idea in mind that they would be connected to the larger globe. <laughs> So for that reason, an IoT platform has to fundamentally address security in your manufacturing operations. And I can tell you war stories in private about the degree to which plants are open in ways that are not good. Right. And then finally, it's scale. One of the things I have found in my work, and it's almost a competitive thing where I walk into customers and we begin a process of transformation, and I find out there's a bunch of DIY projects happening, a bunch of little projects. Remember the 80% failure rate that I told you about? It is not that hard to get some really sharp people to write some quick software, connect to a PLC or, or, or a machine or something, get some data off, and declare success. It's actually not that hard. What's hard is doing it at scale, 500 machines. We saw the first projects this year, this past year, asking to connect up more than 10,000 devices. 10,000 assets, 10,000 machines. That's a whole different level. That's a whole new type of system. And to do so in a production ready engineered fashion, meaning that I need this to be reliable and, and two nines of reliability is not success and three nines of reliability might not even be success. I'm capturing data off of machines and process that require aerospace rig, machining, and process, and that's at a different level. So scale has to be the problem that we solve. So these are the four things. As you, as you make your evaluation on digital technology, if you can't answer these four questions, then the solution, and, and I would add openness to this, right? That goes without saying, right? Is it, does it connect in an open way? Or are you paying a toll for every time you get a piece of data off of it, right? So the internet, right? works because it's open. Works because you're not paying a toll every time you get a, a little bit of data. You may pay for access to your phone, that's a whole other story, but you're not paying for every bit of data. Right? That slows things down. So let's talk about the eye chart. Right? I just wanted to abuse you with this more than anything. Um, this is just a little snapshot of the smorgasbord with protocols that we encounter. And you can look at this later on and, and disagree or disagree or agree. But in reality, that's, that's what you're faced with. And I can go into a small job shop and find a fair amount of this in just a small job shop. I'm not talking a, a, a million square foot factory. Right? So, so this is part of the challenge. This is the language question that we talked about just a moment ago. And then we have just general diversity. So the blue box in the middle is this is this mythical IoT platform that's connecting up everything, grabbing that process telemetry, the vibration data, the torque data, the process data, whatever is, is valuable. And then what do you do with it, right? You have to distribute it to other things that talk other languages, right? You have MES systems that might want to consume it. On their execution, they might be interested in the process, how it was actually executed, not what was planned. That's very interesting in, in the execution world, right? So, so we have this diversity problem, and you have cloud providers coming at you, you have application providers coming at you, and then of course, in the, in the manufacturing area itself, you have sensors, machines, you know, we're censoring our machines, right? Clearly, for good reason. And I want that data, but I, I, don't, I don't want that data just to fill up a, a bucket. I want that data to do something. So we begin with, what do we want to do? Not do we want to connect up a factory, not do we want to collect data, what do we really want to do? So let's review kind of the journey and where we want to go. So if you have to assign value to where you start and where you end up, 
it's pretty clear that if you can optimize a process and you can predict when it's going to be when it's going to fail, that's pretty valuable, right? I don't I don't have to convince you of that. The challenge is it's so valuable that that's where everyone wants to start. Everyone wants to go to where the value is. It's very logical, but it's the wrong place to start. You really want to start simple. You really want to make an investment that you can build on step by step by step. That's the nature of manufacturing, in fact, is constant evolution, constant evolution. It's not like Wall Street. It's not a quick win. We're here for years. I fully expect to be invited back to Mazak five years from now to present this again, right? <laughs> The industry's long lived, right? People form relationships in manufacturing and they and they last for 25 years. It's actually a phenomenal industry to be in because of its nature, its long term, and its thinking. Well, we need to take the same approach to digital technology. Let's not pay attention to Silicon Valley. There's lots of cool stuff in Silicon Valley, don't get me wrong. We have tools that we, we wanna bring to manufacturing which will help transform manufacturing but don't pay attention to business cycles in Silicon Valley, right? We want to begin with basic monitoring, very basic monitoring. Give me a real-time picture at any point in my operational cycle of what's going on in my factory. Eliminate my paper roll-up. I could take you to a uh, transmission manufacturing plant, roughly a thousand machines. They do a paper roll-up every day on every line every shift I should say 11 by 17 sheet of paper line manager fills that out they have a room where they have a million sheets of paper and and this is a state-of-the-art facility I have deep respect for what they do but that's just the only way they can get data it's it's just the only way they can get data they're generating a couple thousand sheets a day and if you are just begin to monitor your process and you can eliminate that paper and you can eliminate the basic kind of manual roll up which is very inaccurate we know from studies that manual roll up of information on a process is is there's some five to ten percent inaccuracy almost all the time so we begin there and we begin to think about the next step as scheduling and maintenance and not reaching for predictive not reaching for solving you know, predicting the future. But very basic, I'm gonna walk you through those two examples right now, predictive, no, I'm sorry. I'm gonna walk you through scheduling and maintenance and make the case for why a basic integration to these systems, whether, you may not even have a scheduling system, it's possible you don't, but I have a hard time imagining that you, you don't schedule manufacturing. Um, so we're gonna walk through that in order to describe how we get to value. And ultimately, yes, you want to get to an optimized process and facility. Ultimately, you want to be able to predict when things fail. That's great. In fact, if I were to do predictive, I would turn to Mazak and say, how's that going? Because it takes more than data scientists. To do really good predictive, you need applied engineering and data science. And you're not going to go to the place where all the data scientists live and find your predictive algorithms for machine failures. You're going to go to Mazak. Right? because they have the applied engineers, because to train your modeling, you actually need people who understand the process and how the machine operates. So just a little insight into, into how you do predictive. It is very hard to do, and if you don't have the engineering skill at the table, the data science doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So let's jump into, and, and by the way, Scheduling was not something I thought of as an integration point for IoT. When I, in beginning my own journey, I did not pick scheduling. Customers taught me this. Right. So first lesson, listen to the people who know about their manufacturing process and what they're struggling with. And what's really interesting is that a lot of scheduling is very manual. I kid you not. A lot of people are doing it in spreadsheets, and that's fine. But what if, what if you have a picture, a history of your utilization, of how long it takes on average for a particular part to be machined or fabricated, and you can track the cycle time on that process. 
What if I can develop a picture for utilization across my factory? Where's my downtime? What, where, what are the machines that are producing the most cubes per minute? for a given class of part, for a given class of machine. And then I use that to inform my schedule, right? I'm, I'm actually now making scheduling decisions on real data based on how my operation has been running. That's the power of IoT, it's not by itself. It's how am I integrating this process data, the, the state of my process, the state of my line, the state of my machine, that gives me a picture of what's actually happening in my plan, right? The difference between planned and actual. IoT gives you a window into actual. And actual should inform your schedule, right? We, we know what we want to achieve, that's what the planning's all about. But did we achieve that? Well, oftentimes we're only finding out whether we did achieve it by looking at our margin and revenue, right? If you're aerospace, you'll find that you'll find that your production is lumpy towards the end of a month or a cycle because it's taken much longer to make the parts. And there may be a thousand reasons why, but you don't know why, you just know that you're bunched up. And at that point, it doesn't matter how you achieve your order. At that point, it's what overtime is required to get that order done, or am I outsourcing? What am I gonna do to get this order through the door? So. IoT should be informing your schedule because you've seen the actual, not the plan. You have a picture of what happened. That's very basic. It's, it's not, I didn't come here to give you rocket science and tell you there's some magical thing you can do. No, it's, it's about blocking, blocking and tackling and using this technology in the right way. That's really powerful and I get excited by that because you could, you could turn a plan around just on this use case. You could turn an operation and make it profitable just on this use case. This is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what we can do. Now, when you get into more sophisticated software, scheduling software, that doesn't just look at a plan, right? That actually looks at your whole value chain from source to destination, and the scheduling is getting really sophisticated now because they're already anticipating maintenance, repair, and overhaul in the whole schedule of everything, then suddenly IoT integrated to that gives you the ability to dynamically reschedule as you go based on events that are happening right now in manufacturing in your operation on your line, your scheduling software may have AI or machine learning, and it's gonna tell you now you should push your material here. You should use those machines that have capabilities, right? This is where it goes, right? So if you're, if you're capturing actual information, a real-time view of your operations, and then feeding that into schedule, but I just tell you that's where it ends up. That's not where you start. You don't have to do that big of a project to get value out of this. So let's talk about maintenance. How does IoT transform maintenance? So we're all familiar with reactive maintenance. Something breaks, I gotta fix it. That dominates a lot of manufacturing, and it's why there is such a strong desire to predict. It is why we want to know the future so that we can avoid the pain of a machine being down. And I've seen that. It's not fun in discrete manufacturing. It's really painful. I'll tell a story, I gotta tell a story. So I was in an auto plant, and we were doing a tour. We were talking about IoT technology and software, and a line went down. I will name the auto plant. And it's, um, you have to watch the tech go to the local computer that interfaces with the automation system that was down. So, you know, this person's furiously trying to figure out what's going on. And then a line manager comes, and the line manager doesn't go next to them and, and you know, kind of say, hey, what's up? They stand about three feet behind and just wait. And then five more minutes, 10 more minutes, this is a full production line in an auto plant. Five more minutes later, there was a, a, a general manager staring. It's not a pretty picture, particularly in, in discrete assembly when a line goes down. It's real pressure. I, I would not enjoy that. So maintenance is such an interesting use case because it turns out that if we wanna just 
make a little step and, and move from a reactive response oriented maintenance system to one that is more proactive, but not all the way to predictive, right? Again, that's the, that's the stars. Knowing the future would be great, right? In a lot of ways. But, but maybe that's not where we begin. Maybe the future is not where we begin. Maybe we leverage the power of a system that tells me what's going on in my machines. What if, for example, I had this wonderful Maze X CNC, and I'm sure you capture this data on your machines, and I just want to track across a bank of 100 machines what my spindle turns are on the machine. And I'm just going to pick an arbitrary number. My IoT system is capturing this data across all these machines. It might be Maze's IoT system, iSmart Factory. And I just know, based on number of turns, that it's about time, from my experience, that I need to take a look at that spindle in the bearing set. Now, did it fail? No. But it's a little different than a time-based scheduling system. Time-based, I just kind of guess that at about a month, given my current production rate, I'm going to see 500 million spindle turns. And you know, our calculations over 20 years of work tell us that that's about time to service the bearing set on that spindle. But, but what if you didn't actually, you don't need to do that. Why waste the labor to go look at it when you can get an accurate picture of usage? on every subcomponent in that system, and I would argue for almost anything. I mean, if you have a dumb press brake, if you just have a press brake, and we put a little sensor on it, and I know you guys have done that in your factory here, you can feed that data into MT Connect and capture how many operation cycles you have on that press brake on a device that's not even digital, right? So, so that's proactive maintenance based on usage. But let's go one step further. Let's talk not about usage, which is compelling, but let's actually talk about event-based or condition-based. We're not predictive yet, but, but now what I've seen is, let's just say I have a spindle crash, someone messed up on the setup, <laughs> someone misplaced out of, out of, you know, maybe it was 80, 180 degrees out of out of you know position on a setup, and I crashed the spindle. You know, maybe I thought I could get away with not reporting it. I know spindle crashes happen a lot. And it's really expensive when you destroy a spindle, but that would show up as a force in the IoT system because that data is captured. Right? There's lots of amazing sensors on these machines. And I would want to know that I saw a transient in a force that just doesn't make sense at all. So that's a condition that I want to trigger a maintenance event on immediately. And it's almost like, it's not like I'm looking at the operators, but I'm really just looking at the machines and understanding the state they're in. That's very powerful. Do I need to be predictive on that? No, I don't. Because in that event, it would be impossible to predict when it fails because I've had a transient event where I quite, I really don't know the impact on the metallurgy, on the stability of that system. I really can never even predict that because it's a one-time event. So that's where predictive even fails you if you think that that's what you want to achieve. But if I know the transient or I know the trend, my vibration Right, the force required to turn the spindle keeps going up ever so slightly. Do I know where the curve ends up? No, not necessarily, but I don't care. I can clearly see the trend. So condition-based, event-based, preventative maintenance is very powerful. It's, it's completely underutilized and not thought of. But that's where we can go. That's the value of an IoT system when you're aligned to an outcome, right? The outcome is to fundamentally eliminate a large percentage of my equipment failures <coughs> that I really couldn't do in a predictive way, right? So let's walk through the logic of it and how we can tune the system till we eventually get to predictive. So I'm gonna walk you through a series of steps. And by the way, it's not just CNCs. I'll give you another example. What if I have an autoclave, so in aerospace, there's a lot of carbon fiber 
composite production. There's a lot of curing that goes on. These autoclaves, as it turns out, are really sophisticated. Um, they're often run at vacuum. They're often run at high pressure. There's incredible temperature gradients across the system over time and within, within the space. Uh, and what would be a transient there might be a temperature spike that damages a seal that no one would ever catch, that no one would ever catch. But yet that temperature transient, that excessive temperature on a seal is absolutely a perfect opportunity for maintenance to take a look at that and that's valuable time spent. So this is another example where IoT should be transforming existing process and operations in a very fundamental way, in a very sound way, right? Without reaching for the stars, as I mentioned earlier. So let's talk about, you know, how we tune this system. In the beginning, you could just use, right? If you have the software, you could just use basic logic operators, right? Greater than, less than. A temperature, greater than. Um, spindle turns, greater than. A force, greater than, or less than, right? You can set your failure points, your transient points, and you tune the system, and you can do this on a per asset basis. That gives you insight and informs you of the nature of your operations in a very fundamental way. We could begin to combine operators. We could look at multiple tags, multiple pieces of information that gives me a more complete picture of the process. A temperature plus a pressure, right? Plus a number of cycles. You, you begin to have a very flexible way to develop a picture of the state of your system that gives you insight into when to take action. That gives you insight into when to have a maintenance cycle on that to roll up uh, something where someone needs to pay attention to it from engineering. Now, those were two basic thresholds, two basic ways of measuring transients for multiple tags, if you will. We can then use all that data that we're capturing over time and begin to trend. I'm not doing predictive yet, but I'm trending. So, here we can use very, very basic techniques to drive value in our manufacturing operation without doing a Manhattan Project, without hiring a group to come in and, and really develop algorithms that are very specialized. This is very basic, actually. But if my connectivity and openness is there and I've made the investment in everything, in the, and I think of it as a utility that enables these use cases, and there's one after another of these use cases. Right, very straightforward. And then of course we get to predictive, which has many uses, and of course, if we could do that, we would do it all the time. That would be the best case of all. But I can tell you the mathematics of doing predictive are very hard. Very hard. It's not simple, it's not easy. So let's use some numbers. You can look at this on your own time, but I want to point out something here. If I, if I take standard event frequency that we find commonly in aerospace, it might be very different in auto, you can easily build, this is for 2,000 machines, you can easily build a business case on the low side and the high side for the return on investment for having an IoT system based on failure rates. If I reduce my failure rates by 25%, if I'm able to prevent them at a certain number, I can have a huge impact on my business. Very fundamental, this is where you build the business case. You look at your scrap rates, you look at your maintenance events, and you work backwards into the metrics that you need to achieve an outcome. And by the way, when just one of these use cases will pay for the full IoT investment in general. And oftentimes, it will do in months. But it's very much about fundamentals. And I think we're gonna publish these slides so you can take a look at this. These are just basic, you know, scrap rates and maintenance events and issues that we see, failure rates that we've seen in aerospace, right? It might be a little different than a lot of them. Uh, another one, uh, you know, cycle time, just tracking cycle time. So if you're machining and you have a part, you can actually look, and it's, and it's a high volume part, you can look over time, is the cycle drifting on that? So how is that impacting EBIT? How is that impacting my standard, earned standard hour, right? Is it drifting? 
right? These are the hidden ways in which money is lost in manufacturing that we're not capturing because we're just not seeing the process in real time, right? So how does that play out um, in terms of an ROI? So if, if I look at um, the example of high volume, uh, low mix machining and auto, or if we go to aerospace and we look at high mix, low volume, but, but specialized parts, particularly this is more true um, in hard metals in aerospace. Not necessarily every job shop is going to look like this, but we find somewhere between a million and a million and a half in revenue per machine. Just by monitoring the machine, not doing even the use cases that I identified for you here, just by monitoring the machine, we can have on average a three, I like to use 3% because it's very conservative, but it's really more. But at 3%, we can actually define an ROI for investing in digital transformation in your factory just on the basic use case of monitoring. And I think, I think that the, what Maysec achieved was way higher than that. Like you guys made an investment probably a decade ago and began this process. And I think it was an extraordinary leap for you, right? And so very, very powerful. Um, when you when you look at that revenue and calculate the ROI, it's a fair amount of revenue. It's forty to fifty thousand dollars additional revenue per machine, or savings per machine per year. That's a lot of money, and that's just the beginning. I haven't applied my maintenance strategy. I haven't applied my scheduling strategy. I'm not looking at my fixed variable cost yet, really. I'm just monitoring state of the machine. So. When we look at how we make decisions, it's really about where do I want to focus? And from a strategy perspective, you're trying to drive your focus on the variable costs. What are the things you control? Scrap rate, labor, um, indirect material costs, like tooling and spare parts and things of that nature. From a strategy perspective, that's where you're going to drive your investment. And this is the outcome. This is the starting point for all the technology that you may be looking at to make an investment. And if we, if we look at the production environment, and it's different based on whether you're high volume or whether you're high mix, right? We can predict fairly accurately based on the KPIs that we target, what type of return, what type of uh, potential improvement you get on your operation. So I wanna shift a little bit, come back to standards as we kind of close this out. Um, a couple of things are happening that I think are valuable and, and worth noting. Uh, MT Connect and OPC have unified on the companion spec, so why does this matter? The, the world seems to be unified around these two protocols. OPC is very pervasive um, in Europe and internationally. And the fact that AMT has worked with the OPC Foundation to integrate um, is, is, is a big deal in manufacturing. It's probably not reported on as much as it should be, but it's really a big deal because that's the beginning of unification for manufacturing standards. Um, NT Connect is an ANSI standard now, right? Again, another unifying standard that's brought together. These are very fundamental things that probably don't seem exciting, but you know, it should give you faith that when you choose a standard like MT Connect, which is a data dictionary, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, there's something behind it more than just AMT, right? So it allows for you, I mean, right now we've taken the MT Connect standard and we can actually unify data for a whole factory with this standard alone. So everything coming off of every asset in the factory can talk this language, it's open, and it makes it very easy for us to make decisions because the language is unified across many, many different types of assets that all speak different languages. So once we get it into the MT Connect standard, we have, to have data now in a form that's immediately readily usable and we can operate on. Why does that matter? So if I were to tell you that when you capture data off a manufacturing process, where, where does one spend their time? Well, data scientists actually call it data wrangling. They actually, when you put the data in a database, you have to go back in and figure out what it was. That is a lot of time, it's very consuming. It means that your data is not available for decision making. So let's close on what, the, what these challenges are in manufacturing and how you want to address your decision making process, right? So, a large percentage of IoT projects are not aligned to outcome. 
So you really need to think about the outcomes you want to achieve. Uh, you have to anticipate the diversity, so you're looking at standards like MT Connect to help you make technology decisions that are appropriate for the environment. The data and scale have to be solved so that you can act on the information you have. The case of a gearbox failing, the case of a process that has reached a threshold that triggers a maintenance event, all of that occurs because you've made fundamental decisions in terms of how you integrate this environment. So these are the things that you go back to your operations and begin to think about in terms of that decision. We're still early in manufacturing, right? We're still solving the connectivity problem, right? It's 20 years later, we're still solving the connectivity problem, right? We have lots of advanced technology, but the operating environment hasn't changed a whole lot. So we have to work on why that is, and I think it's a business issue. It's not a technology issue anymore. It's how we approach the problem and we need to change. So begin with connectivity, think about visibility. Ultimately, once you get visibility, you can begin to ask questions of why did this happen? How do I change this in the future? What will happen, the predictive, and ultimately, how can I continually optimize this environment? So I wanna thank everyone for taking the time to listen through this. I'd like to open it up to questions if, uh, if there are any.